Well, I'm glad we were all able to uh, come back tonight. Thankful that the Lord blessed and didn't get any bad weather. It got a little rain. I saw this afternoon over in Alabama that uh, they had some places where it was pretty severe. Uh, so we're thankful the Lord's taking care of us. I know some of those people be in trouble. We need to remember them. 1 Timothy chapter 4. You're going to open your Bible. 1 Timothy chapter 4. We want to continue in our study uh, through the book of 1 Timothy tonight as we've come to beginning of chapter 4. Let's bow in a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we're thankful that we can be back in your house tonight and we've come for the purpose uh, to worship your great and holy name and to study your word. And I pray now that as we look into your word, you'd open our hearts. Father, I realize that uh, your word is uh, quick and it's powerful, it's sharper than any two-edged sword. And it's able to pierce even to the dividing asunder the soul and spirit, the joints, the marrow, and it's a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. And Heavenly Father, we know that uh, your word is able to be understood as uh, the Holy Spirit would even be our teacher. And so I pray tonight that we could uh, have a greater knowledge of your word as we look into it, that your spirit could guide us into the very truths, the deep truths of your word. And then, Father, as we... Uh, learn more of you, I pray that we'd be willing to submit ourselves to you, that you could bless us as we'd be a doer of your word. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. If we come here to chapter 4, uh, I want to real briefly just uh, go back over what we looked at last week. Uh, but when you think about the teaching ministry of the church, that in a lot of circles it's much maligned, is it not? that uh, there's a lot of people that don't see a need for the church to teach, that they want to go and hear an entertaining message and leave and maybe come back the next Sunday. I know a lot of places today, I'm not going to try to get on my soapbox on this, but it's on my heart. A lot of places today that, you know, a lot of churches have just gone to just one Sunday service. And when you think about that, that that's one less opportunity you have to teach. I feel like the I've, I've, just in my mind, I feel like that the Sunday morning service is uh, certainly that salvation needs to be preached as the Lord would lay that upon your heart. And, and uh, I always look at Sunday night and Wednesday night as an opportunity to do more teaching, not saying that there's never a time to preach and even to preach evangelistic type messages. But the teaching ministry of the church is what's going to grow us. And I'm thankful that you're here. You may, <laughs> don't ever get in your mind that it's not important to come and to study. Uh, you may say, well, you know that all we're doing is not studying. There's no need for me to come. Well, that's what grounds us and, uh, and uh, grows us in the Lord, is the study and the greater knowledge in His Word. Having said that, that uh, last week we finished up chapter 3, as I said. And, uh, chapters 2 and 3 dealt with one particular topic, and that was the order and duties in the church, uh, especially uh, in public worship. And uh, it really summed it, summed it up in verse 15 of chapter 3. But if I tarry long, that thou mayest know how thou oughtest to behave thyself in the house of God, which is the church of God, the pillar and ground of the truth. Now, chapter 2 dealt with the men and women and uh, the role that they have in public worship. And then, of course, chapter, chapter 2, rather. Chapter 3 dealt with uh, the qualifications of the ordained officers in the church. And uh, we tried to stress last week, I, I believe, that through verses 14, 15, and 16 of the third chapter, that there's no, greater, there's no greater place in the world that there needs to be order and things done the right way than the church because it is the church of God. It is the pillar and ground of the truth. And uh, it has a profound impact upon the lives of those that would come in contact with the church. We have, the, we have a monopoly, I think I use that term, to get the gospel out. So it's very important that, uh, that we as a church, that we be in an orderly fashion, not just in any order, but the Lord's order so that the work of the church can be carried out. Now, in chapter 4, we move to a new section in this epistle. And uh, I'm going to go ahead and tell you this. Uh, chapter 4 really can be divided into three sections. And uh, what I want to do tonight is look at the first section, and that's verses 1 through 5. Uh, and then it sort of changes gears, beginning in verse 6 down through verse 11. And then, uh, beginning in verse 12 down through verse 16, is the third section 
in this chapter. And, if, and when you read it and study it, it's very obvious. It's not something you have to go and look at somebody else's outline to figure out. But it's very obvious that this chapter, uh, there are natural divisions there in those verses that I gave you, verses 1 through 5, then verses 6 through 11, and then verses 12 through 16. So let's, look, let's read chapter, uh, chapter 4, verses 1 through 5. And uh, I've studied and I've thought and I've meditated and uh, I want to make sure that what I bring out tonight, I'll bring it out in context. And so you continue to pray for me. Verse 1, Now the Spirit speaketh expressly that in the latter time some shall depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils, speaking lies and hypocrisy, having their conscience seared with a hot iron, forbidding to marry and commanding to abstain from meats which God hath created to be received with thanksgiving of them which believe and know the truth. For every creature of God is good and nothing to be refused if it be received with thanksgiving, for it is sanctified by the word of God and prayer. There are several of these verses here that you're probably pretty familiar with. Uh, no doubt that uh, as I began speaking about the latter times, that some would depart from the faith. That's a, a verse that is used you know, used pretty often in preaching. And of course, then you go on down to verse 2, and it talks about that there were those that had their consciences seared with a hot iron. And uh, that's used a lot in preaching. Uh, you go on down to verse 5, it's sanctified by the Word of God in prayer. If I were to just throw that verse out at you and ask you, what was that talking about? Probably some of you could have told me that's talking about what we eat. And yet, that, that's. Even though those verses are used independently and they're used in, the, in sermons dealing with other topics, they all go together. And uh, that's what I want to try to do tonight is to pull all this together and help us understand that this is one thought that's given to us in these five verses. And really these five verses, I don't have a catchy title to uh, put to these five verses, but they're dealing with false teachers is what the, the topic or the context of these uh, five verses are, verses one through five, is dealing with false teachers. And what's going to happen is that the false teachers are going to be described in the first five verses, and then it's going to be contrasted with the true teacher, the true shepherd, uh, beginning in verse six. And of course, that Paul is going to urge Timothy that you don't be that, uh, you don't be, not only don't be that false shepherd, but don't take heed to these things. Don't get caught up in these things. You warn the people of what these false teachers are even teaching. And then you be that true shepherd. You be uh, what you ought to be. Uh, put you a, a mark, a bookmark or something here, uh, or just hold your thumb. And let's go back to the book of Acts chapter 20. Uh, and let's read a few verses of scripture here in Acts chapter 20. And again, all this tonight we're dealing with is, is false teachers. Acts chapter 20. Remember that Timothy is at the church of Ephesus. That's told us, or that's told to us, in the first few verses of chapter 1. And uh, when we go back to Acts chapter 20, that when Paul leaves Ephesus, that uh, as he meets with the elders there, and he uh, encourages them, uh, he uh, exhorts them to continue to contend for the faith, he makes a statement unto them in verse 29. And let's read verses 29 and 30 of Acts chapter 20. Paul lets, him, lets these elders know that he doesn't feel like he'll ever get back there. And yet he makes this statement to them in verse 29. He says, For I know this, that after my departing shall grievous wolves enter in among you, not sparing the flock. Also of your own self shall men arise speaking perverse things to draw away disciples after them. For just a minute, let's look at those two verses. Paul said that there's something that's going to happen after I leave. It's going to happen in the future. And that is that wolves are going to come in among you. Now, God's people referred to as sheep, right? So wolves coming in among the flock would be there for one reason. That would be to destroy the sheep, to destroy the flock. And notice the wording that's used here, and it's not uh, by accident that this is used. Every word, every punctuation is important in the scriptures. But he said that they'll, these grievous wolves are going to enter in among you. And then he said in verse 30, of your own selves shall men arise. 
speaking perverse things or crooked things to draw away disciples after them. So Paul lets them know he doesn't sugarcoat this. He said, you're going to have those that come in and try to destroy the church. And they're not going to come from the outside. He said, they're going to come from the inside. They're going to be those that are among you. And their desire is that they're going to destroy the church. They'll come of your own selves and they'll speak perverse things. These are untruths. These are things that are opposed to the word of God, what I've taught you. And the point will be to draw disciples after them. Okay, so remembering that, let's go back to where we just read in 1 Timothy uh, chapter 4. The same group of people. Same church. So he said in verse 1, Now the Spirit speaketh expressly. The word expressly means very plainly. This is not something that is in code or it's not something that is going to be hard to understand. He said very plainly. The Spirit speaketh that the Lord's letting you know this through me. That in the latter times some shall depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils. Now, I don't want to answer out loud, but what do you think when, you, when he makes a statement, the Spirit speaketh that in the latter times? When are the latter times? Don't say anything. Don't think today or in the future. This is written 2,000 years ago. The word latter, the phrase latter times means very near, the very near future. In other words, Paul was writing to Timothy and to the church here and saying, it's not going to be long, it may already be there. I know we're living the last days, but the latter times, that he, again, that he's speaking of here is a time immediately following the, when it's written. So this is something that's already been in place for a long time. So he said in the latter times... He said some would depart from the faith. That doesn't mean that they would lose their salvation. The word faith there means the doctrine. Uh, it's the same word that is used by Jude uh, when he made the statement in verse 3 that you should earnestly contend for the faith that was once delivered to the saints. That true doctrine, the teachings of Christ, the unadulterated a word of God I want you to earnestly contend for the truth, for the faith. And so he says that some have departed from the faith. Brother Joe Michael, they departed from the truth, haven't they? They departed from the doctrine that was, was given of God to Christ, and Christ taught it to the disciples, and the disciples have taught it to the churches. That They're departing from that. Now, I want you to understand something, and I, I want to take some time just to deal with this particular statement. In the latter times, some would depart from the faith. Now, if they departed from the truth, what does that tell you about them before? They once stood with the truth, didn't they? You can't depart from something if you've never been there. Uh, if you, if you're, going to, you're going to take a trip and you're going to depart from... New Orleans, you're going to fly out of the New Orleans airport, you've got to go there first of all and then you leave. These are people who have left the truth. They've departed from the truth. These people, I believe, these would be church members. They would have their names written in, on the roll at Ephesus, but they would not have their names written in heaven. So they've, they've left the faith. Now, Remember the statement that Jesus made in Matthew chapter 13 concerning the wheat and the tares. He said that the tares would be those that Satan would plant among the wheat. Satan is the counterfeiter. Remember that, he's the counterfeiter. What he does uh, is just a counterfeit of what Christ does. And so as Christ has true, true disciples, as he has true believers, true followers... Satan places those in the church that are tares. They, for a while, they may look like true disciples, but when was the only time that you could tell the difference between a tear and, a, and the true wheat? But Kyle, it was after a while, wasn't it? It was after that fruit was supposed to spring up on the wheat. You see that the wheat produced fruit. The tares did not. Tares were poison. And uh, so it's the same way with a child of God that the 
best way that we can look at a person and say that they're a true child of God is to examine their life. James said that faith without works is dead being alone, that true faith always manifests itself in fruit. It manifests itself in works for the Lord. So while it wasn't possible immediately to tell the difference between the tares and the wheat, give it some time. Just give it some time. And over time, it may be a great deal of time that goes by, but I believe that over time, it will be evident, Brother Clay, whether a person is a true believer in Jesus Christ or if they're just one who has made a shallow profession. And I want to take you to some scriptures uh, for just a minute. Let's go back to the book of John chapter 8. Book of John chapter 8. I want to use the term steadfast as, as the term I want to use. And I, I feel like it's a term, probably describes it as good as any. Steadfastness. Steadfastness in the faith. Steadfastness in your profession. Steadfastness uh, in your study of the Word of God. Steadfastness in your desire to see people saved. I'm not saying that there won't be times you'd waver, but you'd come back. John chapter 8, verse 31. We'll back up and read verse 30. It says, as Jesus, as he spake these words, many believed on him. Then said Jesus to those Jews that believed on him, if you continue in my word, then are you my disciples indeed. You remember the time that Jesus didn't commend himself to those people because he knew their hearts? He said, here, if you're truly my disciples, you've, you've professed a, a, a profession but he said, if you're truly my disciples, that you're going to continue in my word. Uh, go back, since we're here, go back to John chapter 6. As Jesus would teach those that followed him, as he got into the, I guess, more difficult teachings, he said this in Verse 66 of John chapter 6. It said, from this time, or from that time, many of his disciples went back and walked no more with him. What about those that went back? Were they really saved? He said, from that time, they had followed him to a point. But he says, now that they go back and they walk no more with him. And listen to this, verse 67. Then said Jesus unto the twelve, will you also go away? Are you going to go away like they went away? Are you going to leave me? Are you going to depart? Then Simon Peter answered him, Lord, to whom shall we go? Thou hast the words of eternal life. Look at verse 69. And we believe and are sure that thou art that Christ, the Son of the living God. Now, what does that say about those that departed? They weren't sure, were they? It may have been that they were following for other reasons, but it may have been that they still, the verdict was still out with them. They weren't sure that he was the Christ. But these, these men were sure. They said, we're not going away. We're not leaving. Because we don't have anywhere to go. Because only you have the words of eternal life and we're sure of these things of course he goes on down Jesus answered them have I ch have not I chosen you twelve and one of you is a devil do you notice how that Jesus inserts the, there in that particular phrase look I've, I've chosen you but one of you is a devil so even though that that one that was a devil would continue for a time I believe Jesus said this here for a purpose he spake then of Judas Iscariot, the son of Simon, for he it was that should betray him, being one of the twelve. No doubt that, that when Judas would betray the Lord, that the disciples would go back to this day. That the Lord reminded us that one of us is not true, even though he would continue on. There'll be a time when he will continue no more. And uh, I feel like the reason Judas continued as long as he did is because he felt like that he could get gain out of being a disciple of the Lord. You know, he held the, the, the money back. And uh, he probably embezzled from that. 
and what his mind was on. Even you think about the times and experiences in the, that we read about in the Gospels, Judas' mind was not on necessarily people, but it was his mind was on what he could get out of people. And so these people uh, went away. In the book of Colossians chapter 1, verse 23, Paul makes a statement, if you continue in the faith, grounded and settled, and be not moved away from the hope of the gospel. If you continue, if you continue. Matthew chapter 13, flip back there if you'd like to for a minute. Again, this is the parable of the seed and the sower. There's four types of ground that the seed fell on. And I believe that only one of these grounds speaks of someone who's truly a believer. And that's the good ground because there was fruit produced. But if you go to verse 20, you think about the seed that fell on stony ground. He said, but he that received the seed in the stony places, the same as he that heareth the word, and anon with joy receiveth it. I'm probably too skeptical of people sometimes. But I am very skeptical of somebody who maybe never been in church much, never exposed to the Word of God, would come in and maybe a time or two, first or second service, would make a profession of faith. I'm not saying it can never happen. But I believe, Brother Clay, a lot of times that's just emotional. And I believe that's what's being described to us here in verse 21. That anon, it means immediately, with joy he received the word. But you go to verse 21, yet he, had, yet he hath not root in himself. There's no foundation, as we talked about this morning. Uh, that foundation is Christ. He had no root in himself, but he endureth for a while, or he endureth for a while, or he continues for a while. But then when tribulation or persecution ariseth because of the word, by and by, he's offended, he goes away. Was he saved and lost his salvation? No. He had never truly believed. Uh, in 1 John chapter 2, listen to this statement that's made. Uh, this is a very, again, a very familiar statement. Verses 18 and 19. It says, Little children, it's the last time, and as you have heard that Antichrist shall come, even now, there are many antichrists, whereby you know it's the last time. And, and they're described in the next verse of Scripture, verse 19. They went out from us. In other words, they were numbered with us, but they were not of us. Listen to this. For if they had been of us, they would no doubt have continued with us. But they went out, that they might be made manifest that they were not all of us. One more verse of scripture in the book of 2 Peter, chapter 2, verse 22. 2 Peter, chapter 2, verse 22. This is speaking of really the same group of people that I'm trying to teach us about from 1 Timothy, chapter 4 tonight. It's the apostates, those that have departed from the faith. It says this in verse 22 of 2 Peter chapter 2, But it has happened unto them, according to the truth proverb, the dog is turned to his own vomit again, and the sow that was washed to her wallowing in the mire. Why does the, why does the dog turn around and eat his own vomit? There's only one thing that can explain that to you. He's a dog, isn't he? And that's what dogs do. And you can take him, and you can clean him up, and you can try to make him whatever you want to make him. You can make him a, you can make him a lap dog. You can keep him in the house, and you can put all the, the good smell, you can paint his toenails. I've seen that before. You can do anything you want to do with that dog. But when he vomits, what's he going to turn around and do? He's going to turn around and eat it. Because of all those things that you've done to him, have you changed his nature? He's still a dog. That's what dogs do. 
the pig that's washed or the sow that's washed is going to return to her wallowing in the mire. I know some of, some of you showed some pigs and uh, as pretty as you make them, it's still a pig, still a hog, and they're going to return, they're, they're going to go back to the mud because that's what they are. And that's what he's saying about an apostate. The reason they're going back is because that they hadn't been changed. It was only an outward, external uh, change that took place uh, in their life. Let me throw a name out to you. And uh, some of you may have heard of him and some of you may not. I'll just, just ra raise your hand if you've heard. Anybody heard of Charles Templeton or Chuck Templeton? Name ring a bell with anybody? If I'd have asked that 60 years ago, probably everybody in the house would raise their hand. We know Billy Graham, don't we? Billy Graham, I guess, was a vice president and one of the founders of Youth for Christ. Y'all heard of Youth for Christ? And uh, that's really how Billy Graham got his start in evangelism. Charles Templeton was Billy Graham's partner and best friend in Youth for Christ. And uh, he was also a vice president of it. He was vice president the, of, of the Canadian Youth for Christ. And Billy Graham was vice president of the United States Youth for Christ. Charles Templeton was from Ontario, and he pastored one of the largest churches in the city of Ontario. And the first... Uh, crusades, I guess, that, that Billy Graham did is they went over to, I guess, to e England or Great Britain. They went over to, to Europe. And Charles Templeton went with him. And Billy Graham was the... Charles Templeton was the one everybody went to hear. He's the one that had... that the people. He's got the gift of evangelism. He's the one that was the headliner, so to speak. Billy Graham was kind of second guy. Charles Templeton enrolled in the Princeton University School of Theology. And when he came out of there, he was a self-avowed agnostic. In fact, in, I wrote it down, in 1996, he wrote a book it was his memoirs, Farewell to God, My Reasons for Rejecting the Christian Faith. How do you go from being a, a great evangelist to one who does not even, not even sure there's a God? Till the day he died, he's an agnostic. Brother Willie, he didn't have it to start with. You say, preacher, you worry, what right do you have to judge? I'm just telling you what the Bible says. And I've tried to show you some scriptures tonight. He, all, he utterly rejected the Christian faith. Uh... You ever seen people that come make a profession of faith and get baptized and after one or two times don't see them again? What about Demas? What did Paul say about him? That Demas hath forsaken me, having loved this present world. I believe the Bible teaches very plainly that a person who's truly saved is going to continue like I said, I didn't say there'd never be hiccups. But I believe they'll do either one thing, either they'll come back, or I believe the Lord will take their life. If they're truly one of His. Now, the flip side of that is everybody who sits on a church pew all their life is not necessarily saved. But let's go back to where we started. And, and you may disagree with me, but I would encourage you to you know, have an open mind to the Word of God, what the Word of God uh, has to say. And again, I'm not judging anybody. Uh, the, the Bible is just pretty plain that those that truly saved will, will have evidence of that by continuing in the Word. So the, the, verse 1, the Spirit speaketh expressly that in the latter times some shall depart from the faith. They departed from the faith. 
they're apostates. They didn't lose their salvation. It's evidence that they never had salvation. They never truly trusted. Some shall depart from the faith and then notice what they would do. They give heed uh, to seducing spirits. Uh, that just simply means that they would fall prey uh, to seducing spirits. You think about seducing, the word means imposter or misleading spirits. Uh, to false teachers. In fact, in the book of 1 John chapter 4, John wrote in verse 1, Believe not every spirit, but try the spirits, whether they are of God, because many false prophets are gone out of the world. So these that give heed to seducing spirits, they give heed to false prophets, they give heed to, to those who are, uh, who are not the, the teachers of God, not the prophets of God, not the ministers of God. Remember, Satan has his apostles, he has his people. Uh, he's, he's the counterfeiter. He has his churches. And so they give heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils. And then it says in verse 2, it, it describes these false teachers. They speak lies in hypocrisy. Speak lies in hypocrisy. What does that mean? They speak lies in hypocrisy. You ever accidentally misled it? Mislead it. You ever accidentally misled somebody? We probably all have to an extent, something. And maybe you go back and you realize, oh, I was wrong. And they go back and try to fix that. These people don't accidentally mislead anybody. It said they speak lies and hypocrisy. They know exactly what they're doing. They put on a front to teach what they teach. And they know what they're teaching is wrong. And notice why they do it. It says that their conscience is seared with a hot iron. To come to the place where you can mislead people and it not bother you anymore. That's an awful place to be in it. To know you're lying to them. To know that, uh, that, that I don't even believe what I'm, what I'm saying. And yet, remember they do that for filthy lucre's sake. Having their conscience seared with a hot iron. That sounds like a brand, doesn't it? Something that's seared with a hot iron. And that's, they have the brand, they have the brand of Satan on them, don't they? The false teachers. They're branded, they're, they're, they're the ministers of, of Satan. And notice some of the things that they taught in that day. It said in verse 3, forbidding to marry and commanding to abstain from meats which God hath created to be received with thanksgiving of them which believe and know the truth. What false teachers do is they add to and they take away from the Word of God. And they do it in, in a way that's not, a lot, of, a lot of times not easily seen. You, you, you must be a student of the Word of God. Or you won't even pick up on these things. Uh, but the, the first thing he said here, they for, forbid to marry. I'm not going to call names tonight, but... Are you aware of any religions that forbid their clergy to marry? I think we all are, aren't we? Forbid their clergy to marry. Uh, celibacy is what it's called. And again, not trying to be ugly, but look where it's got them. Not a good place. So these teachers in that day, these false teachers were forbidding certain ones to marry. Now, not even forbidding everybody to marry. Or the race would end, wouldn't it? Or it should. There shouldn't be children produced outside of marriage. But they're forbidding certain ones uh, to marry. Now, what does the Bible say about marriage? In Hebrews chapter 13, verse 4, it says marriage is honorable. We just looked at chapter 3 of here in 1 Timothy. What did it say about a, a preacher? He's to be the husband of one wife. Uh, I said this to somebody I believe it was Brother Ray this morning Brother Ray Nelson we were talking before the song service and uh, I want to tell you something and I'm not trying to get brownie points tonight from my wife but uh, my ministry has been blessed by my wife Now, what I told him was, I said, I'm so thankful for her. And I use the example of this past week. Uh, she, she worked every day. She got up at 5 o'clock every morning, got the, got the kids ready, got her ready, prepared for the day, uh, 
went to work all day, got home about 3.30, 3.40, rushed in, got clothes ironed, changed clothes, jumped in the car, we were here at 5, and then got home every night about 10, in bed at 11, right back up the next day, never complained. I want to tell you something, that's a blessing for a pastor. Do you know how hard it would be if I was having to deal with a wife that complained and fussed, well, this is too much, and why, why do we have to go, and this and that and the other? I'd be between, I'd be, be, I'd be pulled in two different directions, wouldn't I? I'm going to tell you something, my wife is a blessing to me, and uh, she's been such a, a benefit uh, to, to my ministry in, in every way, and so that how foolish it would, say, it would be to say that, that a, a man's not to marry. You think about Aquila and Priscilla, oh, she was a blessing to him. They're always together. Remember that? I tried to preach on that a couple of years ago. You never find an instance in the scriptures where Aquila and Priscilla are mentioned apart. They're always together. Now, Moses had a wife that was a hindrance to him, didn't he? Members of poor, she didn't want uh, the child to be circumcised. And uh, finally, that when the Lord was going to kill him on the way, that she took and circumcised him. And she said, cast it at his feet. So thou art a bloody man. Michael was a hindrance to David, wasn't she? So it could be that a wife is a hindrance, but it could be that a wife is a great blessing. The Bible says a man that findeth a wife findeth a good thing. He said in Genesis chapter 1, it's not good for a man to be alone. And so these false teachers were forbid to marry. And then it goes on and says in commanding to abstain from meats. By the way, the word meats, when you see it in the Bible, don't think about pork, chicken, and beef. It means food. They commanded that you were to abstain from certain foods. Now, this is not talking about liking and disliking certain foods. This is talking about that by abstaining from certain foods that you're more spiritual. Does that make you more spiritual if you don't eat certain foods? Absolutely not. In fact, Paul addressed that in 1 Corinthians chapter 8. Listen to what he said in verse 8. But meat or foods commendeth us not to God, for neither if we eat are we the better, neither if we eat not are we the worse. You know of any religions that forbid maybe people to eat certain foods on certain days of the week? During certain seasons? It's not what the Bible teaches, is it? He goes on in verse 4, he said, Every creature of God is good. Be careful how you read that. There's some, some meats I just don't really care for it. I don't think it's good. I don't like goat. I've had it a few times. Some of you don't either. I can tell by your face. <laughs> I don't care for goat. But it's okay to eat goat. There's been some other meats that I've had, or foods. Again, it's not necessarily meats, but but he said everything that God has given us is, is good. It's, it can be beneficial. He said nothing's to be refused if it be received with thanksgiving. For it is sanctified by the word of God and prayer. Now, I want to ask you this tonight. Do you always thank God for your food? I'm trying to think. I've probably eaten meals with every one of you. You know, not just corporately back here, but individually. In your homes or out somewhere. I don't remember any of you just sitting down and eating. I think we all stopped and asked the blessing. I hope you do that all the time, not just when the preacher's with you. Why do we do that? Well, he tells us to right here. He said, you can eat it. Everything that I've created is, is good. In, in, its, in its place, in its context, you can misuse it. Everything God created was good. Everything that's bad is God's creation being, being misused by man. But he said, it's, it's good and don't refuse it if it's, if it's received with thanksgiving. For it's sanctified, it's made holy by the word of God in prayer. Do we have, a, do we have any precedent in the Bible for those that said the blessing? We do. Both Testaments, Old and New Testament. 
You remember when Saul was looking for his father's donkeys? And he went to find the prophet. The people made the statement, said he's on his way. But if you'll go, they were having a feast. Basically, I'm putting this in my words. They told Saul, they said, if you'll go up there to where they're having the feast and wait. Said the prophet's coming. And said they're not going to eat until he gets there and blesses it. What did Jesus do when he broke the bread? Five loaves and two fishes. He blessed it. And he broke it. And handed it out to the people. Uh, do you bless your leftovers? <laughs> you ever thought about that? They already been blessed once. Do you need to bless them again? I always do. And I'll say this. If, I, I mean, for me, I'm, I'm going to stop and say the blessing if it's the fifth time I've eaten it. And spaghetti, I may eat it five times. I like it. It gets better every time. But especially if somebody's with you. They don't know you blessed it the first time, the second time, the third time, the fourth time. That's a blessing. In public, not to make a show, you know, you can ask it, you can just sit down and be looking around and ask the blessing, but I think it's good to just bow your head because you don't know maybe what an influence that'll have on somebody else. Brother Etienne told me this. In certain parts of the province of Quebec, uh, certain municipal governments have outlawed people from saying the blessing in public. And uh, I'm, I'm pretty sure that uh, we have been in some of those cities and uh, had a meal together. And you know what we did? We asked the blessing. And uh, we did it publicly. Did we break the law? We may have broken man's law, but it's better to obey God rather than man. And that's one of those times where it's okay to break man's law because here he said that we're to, we're to bless it. Not to make a scene about it. We didn't stand up and say, oh, everybody, stop. Bow your heads. We're going to say the blessing. We just very privately among ourselves that we said it. So here he said it's, it's good. You don't have to omit certain foods. So tonight as we look at these first five verses, I just want to remind us how important it is that we teach and preach God's Word. Don't get wrapped up in numbers. I thought about this in closing. Satan's desire, you know, the, the best way that he can destroy this church is not from the outside, but to infiltrate from the inside. He can do that. He can use any of us. The Lord told Peter one time, get behind me, Satan, thou an offense unto me. Thou savest not the things that be of God, but the things that be of men. So he can use us. But I, I tell you what I see is very, very frightening. You see so many churches today that it's just raise your hand, repeat this prayer, sign a card, come, we'll baptize you, we'll make you a member of the church. How many of those people are saved? You know, not only are they deceiving those people, but what an opportunity that is for Satan to get in, get in, get in. And I'm not saying everybody that, I would be very, very shocked if everybody on the roll of this church is saved. I think that'd be the case anywhere. But I think that's why we continue to let the Lord do the work. Let Him burden the heart. Let's don't try to manufacture something. Let's don't worry about numbers. But let's do the Lord, let's let the Lord do His work and let's learn and let's study the Word of God so that we can recognize the truth and recognize error. We'll have a song if there be anything on your heart.